From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Providence, Rhode Island calling. Mr. Dollar? Yes. One moment, please. Go ahead. Hello? Hello, Mr. Dollar? Yes? This is Dick Porter. I'd like to hire you. Porter? Uh, Dick Porter. I'm an insurance broker here. Bert Masterson at United Adjustment Bureau suggested I contact you. Oh, what's the trouble, Mr. Porter? <laughs> uh, darned if I know exactly. I just have a client who's taking out all the insurance he can get. I may be wrong, but it looks to me like he's getting ready to die. Oh. Can you help me out? I can try, Mr. Porter. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Richard Porter, 480 Webster Boulevard, Providence, Rhode Island. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Shepherd matter. Expense account item one, $15. Airfare and incidentals, Hartford to Providence. I arrived at 2.30 in the afternoon and was in my hotel room by 3.15. At 5 o'clock, I was having a quiet drink with Porter, who turned out to be a 24-year man in the insurance brokerage business and seemed to know what he was about. I've never had anything like this happen to me, and I didn't quite know what to do about it. I'm glad I can get some expert advice from you. Well, I don't know how expert the advice will be, but I'll do what I can for you, Mr. Porter. Uh, Want another one of these? No, I'm fine for now, thank you. I'll try to explain this matter as far as I know. Two days ago, Dr. Shepard called me up and inquired about rates on straight life insurance. Mm -hmm. He's carried about $20,000 worth of policies, so 10 years or better. Um, I have the figures in my office. Mm Mm-hmm. I gave him the prices for coverage, and he said he'd take $80,000, which would bring him up to an even 100000 Now, Shepard's a single man. The beneficiary on his other policies is his mother, Claire Shepard. She lives over in Pawtucket. He's only dependent. He wants to name her beneficiary again. I see. Now, where do matters stand with Dr. Shepard right now? I told him it'd take a few days to draw the policies up. He sent me a check for the first payment and told me to do what had to be done. I don't want to act on his application until I know it's okay. Uh, Sure. Well, uh, what can you tell me about Dr. Shepard? Very little. He seems to have a good practice here in town and does his share of charity work and so on. As far as I know, he's above question. Would have to be, of course, to practice medicine here. He has an apartment above his offices, owns the building, all of his equipment. Know anything about his friends? No. Now, let me understand this about Dr. Shepard. He called you. You didn't call him. He wanted to buy the insurance. Uh, You didn't try to sell it. That's about it, yes. And that's why I'm worried. Give me 100 people and I'll show you 99 out of that 100 who will never, never call up an insurance broker and say, I want to buy some life insurance. People have to be sold life insurance. They'll go out and shop around for fire, theft coverage, automobile insurance, health, almost any kind. But straight life insurance, that has to be sold. On the other hand, suppose Shepard is that one in 100. Yeah, yeah, it may be a perfectly legitimate situation. Yeah, Shepard may have looked into his mirror one night and said to himself, I gotta have $100,000 worth of insurance or I won't sleep a wink. Oh, yeah, it could have happened that way, Mr. Porter. But uh, I have to think of those 99 people in that 100. Sure. Sure, so do I. Well, here's to caution. Cheers. Expense account item two, $25, deposit on a rented car, which I use the following day, driving from place to place, collecting data on Dr. Charles Shepard, M.D. At his bank, I was able to learn that he enjoyed what might be called a lucrative practice, and that, like most people, he spent slightly more than he made. He belonged to a golf club where he was seldom seen. He belonged to a tennis club, which he managed to make three or four times a week. Questioning the pharmacist who had the prescription counter a half block from Dr. Shepard's building and the manager of a cafeteria across the street from same, I was unable to learn who Dr. Shepard's steady companions were or gain any information that would justify his puzzling application for life insurance. Hello? Good morning. Oh, good morning. I'd like to see Dr. Shepard, please. Do you have an appointment? No, I don't. Well, may I have your name, please? Johnny Dollar. 
Dollar. Dollar. Are you a regular patient of Dr. Shepard's, Mr. Dollar? No, no, I'm not. I didn't think I recalled your name. I've been with Dr. Shepard almost five years. Uh, who recommended Dr. Shepard? No one. Well, well, Mr. Dollar, I'm afraid Doctor's out now and won't be back until late this afternoon. Well, now, that's funny. I was standing out in front of here three minutes ago, and I thought I saw Dr. Shepard walk in. Please, Mr. Dollar, he is not in to anyone. What's your name? Why, I'm Miss Streeter. Miss Streeter. Well, yes, but I'd I... I'd like to... to see Dr. Shepard, Miss Streeter. Here. Oh. Insurance investigator? Yes. Will you tell the doctor that? Please? Why, yes, I... I'm sorry, I had to tell your doctor was out. He asked me to say that to everyone who came in. I'm afraid the doctor's been acting strangely all day. I'm very much concerned over him. I excuse me. The tall, pale brunette girl in the crisply starched uniform was certainly concerned about something. She bit her lip, forced on a wan, unprofessional smile, and looked like she wanted to cry just before she disappeared beyond the reception room to seek out Dr. Shepard. I pretended not to notice that part. One minute passed, two minutes, three minutes. No one reappeared. So I pushed the door open and I looked down the corridor leading to the examination rooms and laboratory. I had to notice Dr. Charles Shepard standing at the end of the corridor. Most of his costume was medically correct. White coat, stethoscope in one hand. But in the other hand, he brandished a 32 automatic. And the safety was off. Stay where you are, mister, and get your hands up. pocket do you keep your credentials in? Left inside. I'll get him. Insurance investigator. For whom? At the moment, for Mr. Porter. Dick? Yeah. Well, here, I... I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar. I... I guess I'm very nervous these days. Oh. Uh, well. Mr. Dollar, I'd like to get your address and phone number before uh, you... That's all right, Corinne. Uh, uh, don't you think this might be a good time to go out and get a bite? Well, it's a little early, Doctor. I have some lab tests. Go ahead, Corinne, like a good girl, and uh, lock up, huh? Yes. Goodbye, Mr. Dollar. Ah, uh, yeah, goodbye. Very fine girl, Corinne. She's been with me... Five so years, she told me. Oh. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to explain meeting you in the hallway with this in my hand. Uh, yes. Well, uh, before you try, suppose you snap the safety on. Oh, yes. I, I look somewhat foolish, I guess. You want to come in my office? Sure. You say Mr. Porter sent Mr. You... Porter told me you made an application for $80,000 worth of life insurance. We, uh, we look into things like that, Doctor. Investigate me because I want to buy life insurance? Yeah, yeah. You're a single man with few responsibilities? Well, I don't know whether to be irritated or not. Am I, am I going to get my insurance? I wouldn't be irritated, Doctor. Put yourself in the insurance company's position. They're just not used to this kind of application. Oh, you, you may get it, I don't know. But obviously you're in some kind of trouble, gun and all. Well, I... You know, the whole thing is a ridiculous mess. Mr. Dollar, my life has been threatened by a man who has definite homicidal tendencies... I suppose I've been acting very strangely lately. I, I don't know whether to leave town or give up my practice. All you have to do is pick up that telephone and call the police and tell them about it. A threat in your life comes under police business, Doctor. I know that, and I would go to the police, only... Well, it's a very delicate matter. I have a patient's welfare to think of. You can't very well treat any patient if you're dead. I suppose you sit down and tell me all about it. All right. Several months ago, I treated a woman named Forbes... A thorough examination and consultation disclosed that her poor physical condition was not based on any organic disorder, but rather upon her own emotional instability. Not an uncommon diagnosis this hectic day and age. You've heard of things like this, Mr. Dollar? Oh, I've heard of semantics and neurotics and psychotics, but I'm not a doctor. Well, let me tell you the psychotherapeutic side of medicine is by far the most challenging, and one in which I've had considerable experience. Consequently, I undertook to treat Mrs. Forbes, hoping to effect a cure... Are you a psychiatrist, Doctor? No, I am not. Don't misunderstand me, Mr. Dollar. In the process of treating Mrs. Forbes' physical ailments, I urged her to recount a variety of experiences, talk to her from day to day, probing all the while for the source of her trouble. 
It has been my intention from the first to place her in the hands of a competent neurologist. I suspected her trouble early in the treatment. She's married to an erratic, ruthless, ill-tempered man, Paul Forbes. Oh. I made a grave error when Mrs. Forbes pressed me last week to... Well, I could only tell her to move out and divorce him immediately. That's pretty extreme advice, Doctor. I know, but I also know the advice was right. Oh, you aren't in sympathy with me, I can see, but let me tell you that any competent psychiatrist would have advised you the same. I approached her husband on the matter a few days ago. What? I explained to him that Mrs. Forbes' health, her very life, is in jeopardy, that more is involved here than just keeping intact a union which has nothing but legality as a binding force. And Mr. Forbes doesn't care for semantics. He doesn't care for Mrs. Forbes, Mr. Dollar. He ranted and raved and accused me of trying to break up his home, and finally he attacked me. I managed to get away. Did he threaten you then? Yes, he said he'd kill me. Who else was there? What do you mean? Who heard him say these things? Why, Mrs. Forbes was there and a servant in their home. Yes, a servant. Upton's his name, I believe. You should have called the police. I should have done a lot of things differently in my lifetime, but I didn't call the police. My prime Mary concern is for Mrs. Forbes. Further shock and guilt complex could be totally disastrous to her. So are you going to creep around here with a gun in your hand? I don't know whether I'd even know how to use it. I... I... Now, why the application for all the insurance? Well, I, I wondered if Forbes might get me. I wanted to be sure my mother was taken care of. I... I don't know whether anyone's ever threatened your life, and you knew for certain he'd try to carry out the threat, but that is the position I am in. Well, what are you going to do? I don't know. I'll think of something, but what about my insurance? That's up to Mr. Porter. If what you say is true, I wouldn't insure you. What do you mean, if it's true? Of course it's true. Doctor, I don't believe it. I left him standing there in the corridor, staring after me. A lonely man. Somehow not as frightened a man as he tried to let me believe. I wondered about that. I was still wondering about it when I went to sleep that night. Now here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow... The Shepherd matter becomes a matter even the police can't handle. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. (laughs) 